our findings. The overall process curtailed fundamental rights and lacked a level playing field, which was compounded by intimidation. As a key example, the UUM observed first-hand cases of intimidation by members of the Forever Associates Zimbabwe, the so-called FAS. While election day was largely calm, it was assessed as disorderly. The late opening of hundreds of polling stations extending into the next day seriously impeded some citizens' right to vote. The delay that was most pronounced in Bulawayo, in Arare, and in Manitaland appear to have disproportionately affected some opposition strongholds. The legal framework could have provided an adequate basis for the conduct of credible elections if implemented properly. Recent legal changes, including the passage of the so-called patriotic provisions to the criminal code, the legislative work on the private voluntary organizations, the PBO bill, and the selective implementation of the Maintenance of Peace and Order Act, the MPOA, underline the closed space for the exercise of freedoms of association, assembly, and expression. Citizen observers face severe restrictions due to a shrinking space for civic activities, and also due to administrative barriers, pressure, consistent intimidation, and even mass arrests on election day that I could witness personally, unfortunately. A raid took place, fact, on election night where some 40 members of key reputable citizens of service organization who are part of the internationally recognized global network of domestic election monitors, the GINDEM. They have been arrested for, and I quote the police in this quote, coordinating the alleged release of election results. That is somehow also their normal job and duty to follow exactly and observe the elections. They were held without legal counsel for some 12 hours, and although released on bail, they are still now facing upcoming court proceedings. During the post-electoral period, the UEOM observed a climate of retribution against civil society, human rights defenders, and political party activists, and even against voters. While the UEOM cannot comment on any developments after its departure, we were notified on, of allegedly politically motivated abductions and even torture. These reports include the recent murder of an opposition activist. I strongly and firmly condemn any violence that has occurred. There is no space for retribution, for harassment, for torture, and for murder in a democratic society. We encourage the authorities to bring the perpetrators swiftly to justice. Against the backdrop on how these elections were conduced, conducted and the post-electoral political climate, the UUM offers 21 recommendations with seven as priority. In particular, the UUM considers that comprehensive and meaningful electoral reform is needed. This especially relates to the right to stand, to associate and to express freely, not limited to by bureaucratic barriers, such as the undue nomination fees. This is critical to bring legislation in line with the regional and international standards exposed by Zimbabwe. It would be necessary that the Zimbabwean authorities show the political will to engage in these reforms to lay the ground for a genuine and credible elections in the future. The UUM also recommends that measures are taken to ensure that the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, ZAC, and its staff are able to operate without political influence at all levels, including in their appointment mechanism and by removing governmental approval of its regulations. Further, the UUM recommends that ZAC provides timely and comprehensive information on all the aspects of the electoral preparations 
to the public, including its decisions and its regulations, and the ZEC publishes timely electoral results, disaggregated by police station. This is crucial also for our work. Safeguard the right of assembly. It is recommended to amend the Maintenance of Peace and Order Act, the MPOA that I was quoting before, to limit discretionary application and to ensure that its implementation never unduly limits the right to assemble. And to safeguard the independence of the judiciary, our UUM recommends as well reviewing the appointment procedure of judges to guarantee a real separation of powers. Further on, the UEM recommends to establish and to implement effective mechanisms to prevent all the undue restrictions on observation activities and to prevent pressure and intimidation to both citizen and international observers. To the bank and inform this information before this, allow me to clarify why we are presenting, unfortunately, I would say, the final report here in Brussels. As per the EU's long-term election observation methodology, the EU UN was meant to return to the country some two, three months after the elections. That was, of course, our will. The purpose of this return visit, and it, it is standard practice for all EU UNs, is to present the mission's final report to the authorities and the public within the country in which we have been observing. The UUM would also discuss the conclusions and the recommendations with local stakeholders in the country to determine possible ways forward to implement the recommendations made. And of course, to engage in a cooperation if that is the will again, of the hosting country. The return visit of the UN Zimbabwe was foreseen in the administrative arrangement that was signed by the EU delegation and the Zimbabwe Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. Unfortunately, the conditions did, did not allow it for it to take place. Prior to the deployment of the mission, it became clear that the Zimbabwean authorities lacked the political will to allow the UUM return visits to be carried out according to its long-standing methodology. This includes key activities such an inclusive and robust dialogue around the report, of course, and its recommendations with a wide range of stakeholders, including civil society, media, political parties. They did not provide any reason for why they saw a need to put restrictions on these visits. The UN highlights that this administrative arrangement stipulates also that Zimbabwean authorities should have granted the mission access to all relevant interlocutors. Yet, the mission faced significant challenges to meet with official bodies at the national level, despite repeated requests and uh, also a uh, good level of flexibility from our side. This includes just to give a very clear example of what I'm saying, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, the ZEC, which the UN was only able to meet once in uh, all our observation, and which was unfortunately equally unavailable for meetings with the, the chief observer, with me, and the European Parliament delegation, the other colleagues from Parliament that came to observe on the ground. While, let me underline also this aspect, other ob observer organizations were granted repeated access several times. Such behavior is unprecedented in my long time as a politician, parliamentarian, and election observer. This is something that really surprised me and shocked me at the same time. This lack of meaningful access was coupled uh, with an ex extensive, coordinated, and continued this information campaign against the UUM and the other international observation efforts on the part of some national media. This reporting was based on lies and violated any journalistic standards. These lies published particularly by state media put in danger the safety of our observers on the ground. While we do recognize 
the independence of the media, of course. We took note also that the government did not respond in any time to this defamation campaign, despite its commitment in the administrative arrangement to ensure the personal safety of all the members of the UUM. While the UUM concludes its work with today's presentation, the EU will continue to be available for the assistance. Aspirations of the citizens of Zimbabwe to live in a free and in a democratic society is a core principle of the European Union and of our action. One that the European Union will always defend no matter what. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We open now the floor for questions and uh, answers. Uh, if you could please uh, introduce yourself once you have the word by name and uh, tell us for which media outlet you work. Uh, let's try to make this work. It's a little different from uh, an in-person press conference, but let's try to get this uh, up and running. Uh, raise your hand uh, if you do have a question for us, please. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Um, I, he, I see a question from Samsung SM uh, whatever. Uh, can you please uh, turn up your, your volume, your microphone, get closer? We cannot hear you. OK. Uh... My name is Chris Pentabra from Choice Media Africa. Um, I would like to ask on the on this final uh, report um, that uh, uh, is. Um, do you see the chances? Government. Uh, uh, sorry sorry for interrupting. Uh, we 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 cannot uh, we cannot hear a word you're saying. Can you move closer to the microphone? Uh, it's it's impossible to understand what you're asking. Thank you. Okay. Let me look at the mic. Uh, all right. I don't know if you can hear me now. No, my my ear, my mic. Still very low. The volume. Please uh, increase. Okay. It's not okay. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me now. The audio is very bad. Perhaps you can turn up both the sound on your laptop or on your telephone. Okay, you can hear me now? A, a bit better. Yes, yes, it's it, it's improving. Okay, uh, I said my name is Chris Bentabra from Choice Media Africa. Um, somebody's interrupting. Please continue. Yes, uh, what is, in, the, in the event that uh, the report is uh, like denied by the by the government of Zimbabwe, what are um, the other channels that can be used? So, in the event that the report is denied by the government, what other channels can be used? Denied. Denied. That's what he said. Or no. refused. Yeah. You mean? Yeah, We're just doing it. Yeah. Can I can I answer? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. In fact, as I said, our duty is to present the report to make it publicly. Of course, the first interlocutor normally is the government, but we also are presenting this report to the media, to the civil society, to all the Zimbabwean people. So uh, let's say that uh, this is something that uh, I think the world. Zimbabwe uh, somehow uh, will will receive, as I say that, and I reiterate that aspect is going to be published as soon as this press conference is going to end. Then, of course, it's uh, up to the Zimbabwean government to decide if he wants to follow the recommendation we express and if he wants to engage with the European Union that is ready to provide uh, cooperation, technical assistance on the recommendation as well. But of course. Uh, this is a matter of political will, and this is a, a free choice of the authorities. If we are requested, we are ready, we are willing to assist, but we cannot, of course, 
decide for the authorities. But I think also uh, in light of the important remarks I shared with you, that it's also a possibility if uh, it's decided in the sense for the media, for the civil society to campaign in favor of these reforms. If you think, if you share, of course, the reasonment, the motivation, the analysis we are going to present in the report. So I warmly recommend all of you to write that very carefully, to have a clear view, and because we assessed all single phases of the process before, during, and after the election day, always following very meticulously our methodology and uh, our conduct, conduct in every single action and phase we have done. I hope I addressed and I answered to your question. Can I also add that the recommendations that we make are long-term recommendations throughout the election cycle, and they're also geared to a variety of interlocutors. And so some of those recommendations are to the state authorities, of course, but then there are also recommendations that are made to civil society, to the media, to other interlocutors. And so over the period of the next three, four, five years, many of these recommendations can be brought to life if there is the will, as Mr. Castaldo had said, but also if there are initiatives amongst different interlocutors who are all addressed in this report. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. It's oh, yeah, my name is Admai Amasubu. I'm a freelance journalist. I want to understand uh, to what extent did the in this information uh, affect the quality of the elections and the participation of women. Did your report uh, maybe dwell on that particular uh, issue? Yes. Yes, so we, in fact, on the mission, looked at all aspects of the election process from a long-term perspective. We had both a social media analyst who conducted a full-scale social media monitoring effort. We also had a human rights analyst who looked specifically at the inclusion of underrepresented populations, including women. And so if you look at the report, there are recommendations also made towards the participation of women in the process and also the extent that disinformation played into the way that women were able to participate in the election process. I don't want to go into too much detail about that, but if you look in the final report in the full body, you will be able to find the details of those findings. I'd like also to add that um, during uh, our conversations and our exchange with many interlocutors, uh, most of them, they were underlined the reforms on the, that introduced quotas for women somehow was also seen as a kind of reduction of the space of participation for the ordinary constituency, in the sense that if you look at the numbers and the statistics in the previous electoral elections, harmonized election, there was more participation of women in the ordinary constituency. They, they would say the directly ele electing one, and uh, of course this give the feeling somehow that uh, despite maybe the noble intent to ensure that a certain quota within the parliament, this is also a bit maybe reducing the space for them to compete equally fairly uh, with the uh, male candidates in the normal constituency. And a similar also consideration was uh, sometimes raised about the youth. Um, my name is Anastasia Androvu. I'm in Bulawayo. Uh, I would like you to tell us uh, were the elections free and fair and credible? <laughs> Thank you for the question. I would like to remind you that uh, it is not our job nor our commitment to give any certification of the elections. We, did, we cannot, of course, declare uh, something like you asked nor in a sense, nor in another. Our job is to follow and to, of course, observe all the different phases of the process, and then to say if they comply or they do not comply with the regional and international standards. And in that case, I could say, as we reiterated 
many times during our preliminary statement, and even today that uh, in several cases they shot fall. They were not exactly complying with the regional and international standards. So there was, uh, especially because many rights have been curtailed during the campaign, even during uh, the election day itself. We are from Bulawayo, so probably you witnessed the fact that uh, many police stations were opening with a very significant delay. So this is the kind of uh, analysis and assess assessment uh, we are holding. Okay. Uh, my other question is, we noted that you, you withdrew funding uh, for elections in Zimbabwe. Um, when are you likely to fund elections again because we are having by-elections? So the funding was withdrawn from the European Union yeah. and with by-elections coming, when are they, are they likely to refund? Well, uh, let me say that the decision of uh, freezing uh, the financial cooperation and the technical cooperation was taken by the EU delegation uh, on the ground, according to the fact that, I, as I denounced, there was a lack of cooperation by the competent authorities. As I told you, I have a long lasting experience as electoral observer and as a chief observer. And it never happened in my, in my experience, in my career, uh, to do not have uh, been received uh, by the competent electoral commission or anyway by the electoral body that is organizing the election on account. That was a clear sign of uh, lack of political will because as I, again, I repeat, many other chief observers, other missions have been received even several times. And that was a bit surprising me because uh, we were, we didn't come by ourselves. We came and we deployed the mission under the invitation of the Zimbabwe government that freely decided to do that. And uh, with an, an, an administrative arrangement that was regulating all the aspects of uh, our presence on the ground, including the fact that we should, uh, we were entitled to have full support uh, by the competent authorities uh, to provide us all the data, to provide us all the information, to have a, a constant exchange. So, of course, having observed that the EU delegation decided to proceed in this way, at this point, I cannot tell you if uh, some moment uh, uh, that there will be a decision again to relaunch a cooperation. I would say that uh, everything is in the end also of the competent authorities. If we will see, see uh, positive signs, a change of approach, probably there, there could be the possibility to reconsider that, but it is not my duty uh, to express any other analysis and decision in that regard because I am the chief observer for our electoral mission, and this is a political decision that is going to be held by uh, the EU delegation and the extern our external action service. So all the authorities that are, has, are, have the duty and the right to do that. And if I could just add that this, as uh, Mr. Castaldo says, is outside of the remit of the EOM, but there are recommendations about key aspects of ZEC, such as their independence, their ability to work impartially. And these are the kinds of recommendations that one would expect to be worked on in the future. Um, and in the implementation of these recommendations, the EU would stand ready to assist. Okay, thank you on that one. My final question is on, uh, as we are having by-elections, is EU going to observe the by-elections in Zimbabwe or you are not coming? Normally, uh, we do not observe by-elections. So I, of course, uh, the mission uh, now, as I said, is uh, ending up with this uh, work, with the presentation of this final report. But I'm pretty sure that uh, our competent authorities and uh, including for the external action service will continue to be engaged and uh, to have a course follow what are the further political developments uh, in the country. But this is out of the scope of the election to continue to assess the by-election uh, after because we are our mandate. Is going, is going to end with the presentation of the final report and the recommendations. 
Uh, we have one more question and then we will answer a couple of questions that arrived uh, through the chat. Yes, sir. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. We are very well. Thank yes. you. What about you? Yes, my name is uh, Marshall Ponya. I am a reporter for Zim Life. I have a few questions that I want to ask. Uh, my first question would be, if your recommendations cannot determine if elections were free and fair based on your methodology, what use is it to the Zimbabwe? Is it to Zimbabwe as a nation in the in the in our plight to grow as a democratic uh, nation? Uh, then my second question would be: How can citizens of the civil society contribute to ongoing efforts to address the issues raised in your report, given the current uh, reports of human rights violations that are said to persist with impunity? And my third question would be. Uh, has your mission observed any positive changes or improvements in subsequent elections since this uh, current election that has been discredited uh, in your preliminary report? And uh, my final question would be, how will your mission's findings and recommendations be disseminated to the international community, local stakeholders, and the general public to ensure transparency and accountability? Okay, so for the first one, so, so society the first one was on, on okay. free and fair and recommendations. Free and fair recommendations. Mm -hmm. And the third. The third I don't remember. And, and the fourth. <laughs> and the fourth was on the. Uh, was the fourth? Let's let's start with the first one, and then we can ask to repeat. Yeah, let's start. Maybe I will. We will kindly ask you to repeat question by question because, of course, we are not in presence, and sometimes uh, some words could. Uh, not be easy to be heard. Uh, you ask for, uh, again, for evaluation for a free and fair election process. I will reiterate again once more that we do not do this kind of assessment. It's out of the scope of our mission. We can only observe and check if what we are seeing on the ground, and it was a massive effort from our side, with 150 observers that deployed all around the country in each one of the single region of Zimbabwe, not simply the most prominent uh, urban center, but also even the rural area in the most remote area of the country uh, to uh, get as much data as possible, uh, to have a clear vision of the broad process, and then to uh, be able to assess if they are respecting or not the regional and international standards, and I do reiterate once more, of course, that uh, this is uh, something that in some significant cases we see did not happen uh, because uh, uh, there was a, a clear reduction of space uh, of the right to assembly, a clear reduction of space of um, freedom of opinion, significant technical problems, including the delays of opening on the police station, a climate of fear and intimidation that many of our interlocutors were underlying. And on the recommendations, once more, we say that this is something that we are leading in the end, not simply of the government, but also of the civil society, but also of all the relevant stakeholders. And we do believe that, of course, no matter what will be the political will to engage of the government, the civil society of Zimbabwe that I can witness, despite the difficult situation that we have, is still very vibrant, very active, very engaged. Of course, we'll have the possibility to do some step forward. Uh, and uh, I reiterate the final message I wanted to give with my speech, with my statement today, we are, as the European Union, besides the aspirations of the Zimbabwean citizens to strengthen freedom, democracy, to have a free and democratic society, because these are, those are also the values on which the European Union is based. And our approach is always value-based oriented. So I can really endorse and reiterate very clearly this commitment, and this is not, the mission is going to end right now, but the Union, as such, will continue to be present beside uh, this important uh, effort. Then, if I am not wrong, uh, uh, there was a second question about the civil society, but I think I answered already with my, uh, my, with my first answer. 
Could you be so kind, please, to repeat the third and the fourth question, please? Uh, my third question is, has your mission observed any positive changes or improvements in subsequent elections uh, since this current discredited election? Then my fourth question was, how will your mission's findings and recommendations be disseminated to the international community, local stakeholders, and the general public to ensure transparency and accountability in the forthcoming elections? Hmm. How will our findings be disseminated so that the international and local community know about what we've said? Um, yes, well, uh, first of all, on the... Sorry? Well, uh, on, the, on the third question, uh, let me say very clearly that uh, there is no connection from one election to another. Uh, of course, you know that we have deployed an election five years ago as well. There were also recommendations, but we are not commenting on this uh, because, of course, each one of the observation and each recommendation is based on what happened in that specific elections. And uh, therefore, that would be uh, outside of the scope of our action and out of our methodology to assess on the base of uh, the previous uh, mission. Of course, this is a factual. Many of the recommendations that have been formulated in the previous mission five years ago have not been implemented. This is a, a something that is objective and is in front uh, of all of us. But again, uh, I cannot comment uh, too much on this, nor I can comment on future uh, elections. I hope of course, that uh, as a personal uh, feeling that the authorities uh, would be keen to engage with us to have uh, this uh, cooperation and uh, we are ready to provide technical support uh, to start a process, a process uh, of reforms to support, of course, the internal process of reform, but it's not up to us to decide if there is a political way or will or not to engage in that sense. And of course, if there, if there will be in the future elections and the European Union electoral observation mission, it will be up to them again to assess all the phases of the cycle, to assess uh, the legal order that is in place, if it complies or not with the regional and international standard. But again, we cannot comment on this because it's something totally in the hand of the competent authority and in the end, of course, of the civil society for what is relating with the recommendation dealing with the civil society. Uh, how to disseminate our conclusion? Let me show you, this is the report. This is uh, the brief version, but the, the, as I said, very soon we will have the digital version that will be available on the website. Of course, we are gonna do our best to make it visible uh, at uh, a regional, local, national, regional, and uh, international level, because uh, it's important also for us to, to disseminate the conclusion to, and that's why it's totally public. Uh, and uh, we ask your support because you are uh, the most prominent media of the country. So we need also your help and support uh, to uh, give the right visibility, to give the most for uh, wide, the, wider, uh, the widest access uh, to the public opinion, because we hope that with these analysis, the data, the reflections, and you all know the recommendation would be a good food for thought for the civil society, for uh, the relevant stakeholders, uh, for the citizens of the Zimbabwe. This is a kind of legacy that we are leaving, of course, after uh, uh, all the efforts of the electoral process. And as, as I said, it was not an easy mission for us on many technical uh, aspects because uh, the lack of cooperation, <clears throat> the authorities uh, pushed us to have uh, additional uh, uh, efforts. But uh, of course, we will continue to remain engaged and uh, we hope to see comments and uh, to see you, of course, uh, use all these data and information uh, to raise awareness in general of the process itself and to the work of the mission that I reiterate once more, was always complying very strictly with the code of conduct and the methodology we are adopting since many years, it's a, uh, absolutely a consolidated, a consolidated one. Thank you. 
And if I could just add that we'll also be disseminating this report to all of the interlocutors that we met during the course of the mission. We'll also be disseminating it via social media and via traditional media in the country. And so hopefully both the report and the recommendations will be available to a wide range of the public. The EU delegation is also on the ground and has copies of the reports that they will be handing out and, and discussing with interlocutors about their activities. And so hopefully through these mechanisms, there will be a wide range of information about what is in the report and the recommendations that we have made. So we have time for two more questions. Uh, I believe the questions that were asked in the chat uh, were in the meantime uh, replied to sufficiently. So we had uh, a raised hand from uh, Shingirai uh, Vambe uh, from the very beginning. Uh, if you should still be here, uh, could you please ask your question? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh sharing the, your 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 findings of uh, the 2023-2024 election of uh, Zimbabwe you in, in in your in your presentation you highlighted that uh, uh the environment actually put uh, the observers lives at risk uh following the conduct by the Zimbabwe electoral commission and uh some of the uh, recommendations of the working uh, ethics that they had put in place. I would want to understand, that is my first question, uh, going forward, do you think you would have more uh, observers coming to observe elections in Zimbabwe? And uh, what in, in, in your recommendation would you uh, propose that uh, things may be put in place so that uh, the issue of safety and risk is uh, uh, taken to account? Then uh, my second question uh, goes to the uh, issue and printing of uh, ballot papers and participation of people with disability. Uh, in, in in your observation, uh, yeah, what 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 did you what did you see as observers uh, on the participation of people with uh, with disability on the printing mm -hmm. of ballot papers? Uh, for example, uh, the, the those with visual impairments. And uh, those uh, probably with the physical disability. In your in your in your report, in your observation, in, in the, the contents of the report, does it highlight uh, part of this uh, uh, inclusivity? Thank you. Um, yes, but we should focus on the yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But thank you very much for your questions on the safety of observers. I would I want to be very clear on that point. As I said, we, are, we have been victims of a massive defamation campaigns that started even before the deployment of the mission, even before that uh, I, as a chief observer, uh, arrived in the country. Uh, this was particularly harsh, uh, led by some media that uh, are, in some cases, uh, uh, state controlled by the government, or in any case, very close uh, to the government, and uh, in particular, there were some unacceptable, fake, uh, disgusting, I would say, accusation, uh, putting in question the moral integrity of our observers. Some of them were even saying that they were bribing uh, people uh, to push them uh, in support of the opposition. This is simply ridiculous. And uh, of course, uh, it was my duty as chief of server to immediately uh, dismantle this uh, castle of, of lies and defamation. Uh, but as I said, we didn't see any official reaction uh, by the competent authorities, by the government saying and reiterating the fact that, first of all, we have been invited by the government officially, that there is an administrative arrangement and that they know, and they have always witnessed the professionalism the commitment, the full respect of our methodology by the mission. This is something that we really deplore. Uh, we, of course, were paying all possible measures to protect our observers on the ground, because we have also security experts within our core team, and we were paying all the possible attention. But if 
there is a, a hate and defamatory campaign that is fueling, uh, uh, trying to fuel uh, sentiment of anger against the people on the ground. Nobody knows what, what could happen, even despite all the possible security force. That's why I said that uh, uh, from our side, we put all possible measures on, in place, but we would have expected a different approach uh, by the authorities because uh, if you are inviting the guests, normally the first rule uh, of invitation, and I know how, how much warm are the Zimbabwean people, uh, how strong is the sense of the hospitality, the first uh, uh, precondition of an invitation is to ensure a full safety. And uh, some of them, they didn't feel really safe in some moment in the development on the ground because of this climate of fake news, fear, and defamation that was held by, uh, <clears throat> from the authority. On the participation of people uh, um, of disability, uh, with disability, uh, our observers, our observers remarked in uh, many cases that uh, not all the police stations were adequate to ensure uh, their full access to participation, but I will now leave the floor uh, to my deputy, uh, Dr. Beata Martin Rodzumilovic, to go a bit further in detail on the data set in Denmark on this uh, mm -hmm. issue of the, the participation of people with disability. And can I also, also say, with regard to the safety of observers, it's not just the safety of international observers, it's also yes. the safety of citizen observers on the ground who continue to do their work. And we are aware of the recent cases of abductions, of torture, of murder, as Mr. Castaldo mentioned. The EU uh, spokesperson has made a statement that there is an expectation that there be a thorough inquiry into all of these recent abduction cases and that culprits must be properly identified and brought to justice. This is also something that our EU delegation on the ground will be following up in terms of any uh, connections to the elections and human rights abuses. So we look at this issue of safety of observers from all angles. But turning now to the question of participation of persons with disability, Again, there is a full section in the final report about this very important issue. We find that unfortunately, no significant efforts were taken um, to grant persons with disabilities participation. Things that we note are that the CPRD um, has not been inc incorporated into domestic law. That's the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, we also reflect upon the fact that the 1992 Disabled Persons Act um, looks at the point of view of welfare rather than a rights-based approach, and this is something that needs to be further examined. Um, many of the interlocutors told us that they would have preferred in the allocation of seats to see uh, members from the persons of disability community directly elected as individuals rather than through the quota system that cur uh, currently exists. But we do make a recommendation which is quite clear, and this is that there be an amendment to the Disabled Persons Act to effectively incorporate the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability into domestic law. And this is one of those 21 recommendations that we hope will be worked on in the future Future, um, to bring the level of rights, both regional and international standards, into a better perspective in electoral processes in Zimbabwe. So we have time for one more very short question, and I see a hand from uh, Zimba Chikanza. Excuse my uh, apologies for my pronunciation. So. Uh, Zimba, if you could uh, just ask one question, a short one, um, that would be appreciated. Thank you. So he seems to be Hello. offline or seems to have technical problems. Uh, at this point, uh, we conclude this press conference. This is the final press conference of the European Union election observation mission to Zimbabwe. Uh, the question was asked also in the, uh, in the chat when the report would be available uh, online. 
uh, it will be go it will be going public uh, at uh, uh, in in a couple of minutes. Uh, if it's not already online, uh, you can find it uh, on the uh, website of uh, the EU EOM. Uh, we will post uh, the respective link also again on uh, our Facebook page, and we will tweet that also on X. So you will have uh, the respective link uh, together with the link for the press release uh, very shortly. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, have a good... Yes, just uh, as a very last statement, we'd like to thank all of you for the participation today in our press conference for your insightful, interesting question. And I would like to personally and publicly uh, express my very warm thanks to the core team of my mission and to all the staff, to all the observers that have been deployed, because for me, it has been a, a real honor to lead such a mission with uh, such a committed professional and uh, absolutely uh, passionate uh, core team beside me. So that I want to really to size that opportunity uh, to thank all of them, to thank all, all uh, the embassies also that provide their help and support uh, <clears throat> with uh, their uh, additional observer and to uh, so thank the 27 member states of the EU and Canada, Norway and Switzerland for the excellent cooperation on the ground. And once more, of course, uh, my core team that was uh, extremely committed in uh, tackling all the difficulties we had to face uh, to bring this mission to the conclusion. Sorry to have interrupted your habit. All right, so that was the final word. Thank you very much and uh, have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.